Well, uh, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you all. Um, I'm going to be talking about asynchronous user interfaces. And I've been told this title is quite a mouthful, so how to lie, lie cheat, and steal. That's the, that's the better title. Um, and so I want to first talk a little bit about Stripe. I've got to pimp my company. Uh, we are basically a payment startup in San Francisco. Similar to PayPal, you can receive payments um, online. But um, we've got like an amazing back end, this Backbone app. You can see all your payments. Um, you can see graphs. You can create payments from inside there. And I've been working on this new product um, called the Stripe Checkout. And basically, you can embed this in your page with one line of JavaScript, and then you get this full checkout experience. Uh, and we A-B test everything for you. Uh, we optimize it. Uh, and, w and we've got nice things like credit card formatting. We've got like a mobile version. Um, so that's what I do with my day job. Um, but I, let's get to the subject of the talk, asynchronous interfaces. So I have a question for you guys today. What makes up design? Like, What are the components of design? And I think there are a number of things. Um, but one, one of the key things um, is interaction. So one of a friend of mine said to me that uh, Dribbble was actually the worst thing that ever happened to design. Um, I didn't actually agree with him, but he had a number of interesting points for this. He says that um, design and interaction are fundamental to each other. You can't separate the two. And Dribbble basically puts the wrong emphasis on things. It divorces the two. Um, on Dribble, and if you're not familiar with it, basically you can upload photos, um, oh sorry, imi uh, designs, and it, it's got a great design community around it, but they're all static, and you can't see people interacting with them. And so he says it puts the wrong emphasis on things. So this is an interesting idea, that uh, design and interaction are fundamental to each other. So let's dive down this rabbit hole a little further. So what makes up interaction, right? And uh, again, there are various parts to it. Um, like for a mobile app, there's definitely like the, the touch, the feel of the app, um, how it responds. But I think uh, one of the key parts of interaction is speed, right? Speed is fundamental to interaction. Um, when, you when you're using an app, you really notice the speed. It's fundamental to the experience. So if speed is fundamental into interaction, and interaction is fundamental to design, then it follows that speed is fundamental to design, right? And I used to work, back in the UK, I used to work for this consultancy, and we make these, um, uh, well, one of the things we'd make is these airline tracking websites. And um, uh, you probably use them, but you basically enter your flight details, and some guy points at you for a while, uh, while it's searching for your flights. And then it will return you the flights, and you can buy them. And it, you're at this stage, you're actually waiting for about 20 seconds. Uh, and it turns out that this uh, waiting stage is actually completely artificial. Um, we, we have the flights immediately. Uh, it's just like a database query. Um, and then uh, we showed this waiting for like 20 seconds. And so I was like, well, why don't we remove the wait? Um, you know, the people get their flights quicker. They use our service more. We make more money. Everyone wins. So we removed the waits, and conversions plummeted. And people just didn't think we were searching for their flights properly. Uh, and uh, I don't know what they imagined that we were doing. Like, we were phoning up the, the, the airlines trying to get the best deal for them. But they just weren't b uh, buying flights for us anymore. So we put the weight back in. So sometimes making things slow actually makes you more money. Uh, but it's usually the opposite, right? Here's three companies, Amazon, Google, Yahoo, that all have their revenues directly tied to the speed of their interfaces. And they know this. So they do a lot of testing. Uh, Amazon, 100 milliseconds of extra load time because of 1% drop in sales. Not much, you may think, but for Amazon size, that's huge. Um, and the key thing here, it's not speed, actually. It's perceived speed. And as developers, this gives us a bit of wriggle room. Because when we're developing on the internet, the network is always going to be a bottleneck. It's the one part we don't control. I mean, we don't control the browser, but that has got a lot better recently. Um, we do also do, But we don't control the network. And the network could be slow. It could be, uh, like... Um, many hops away. Um, and so the, the, the question I have for you is why would you tie your interface, which has to be fast for you to make money, to your network connection, which is inherently slow, uh, why would you tie these two things together? And the answer is because it's easy. It's how the web is built, this request-response paradigm. It's all the tools you get around it. That's how people do things, right? 
And uh, but I don't think it's sufficient, right? The people who go, I think, the extra mile, speed up their apps. Uh, I think will be rewarded. And if, we, if you have a look at the top web companies, they do this. And all we've done over the last four years is basically swap the position of the spinners. Before, they were at the bottom of the page, and now they're in the middle, right? We're not really taking advantage of Ajax, and we're constantly blocking our users and showing them loading messages uh, when we should be doing something a bit more clever. So this is the key thing to asynchronous U U UIs. They're non-blocking. Um, basically, the idea is you never want to block the user from doing something um, and keep the interface as fast as possible. So how do you do this on the internet uh, when you, you may be communicating with a backend server? And the answer is you lie. You basically update the user interface before you send network requests. Um, and you lie. And, and most engineers have a big problem with this. Um, they're like, why, do we, why should we lie to our users? I don't want to be lied to. Um, and the, the thing is, this is not really an engineering decision. This is a design decision. And lies are all around us. Like I say, the top companies um, use uh, async UIs or lies. Uh, Twitter, you hit retweet, and the tweet is retweeted instantly in the interface. In reality, there are like several hops to go through. Um, load balances, proxy servers, all the Twitter's auth servers. And then you go down, maybe put a message on the messaging queue. It could take several seconds for something to actually get retweeted. In the interface, it's retweeted instantly, right? And so this is a form of lying to the users, but actually has a much uh, better benefit because the user actually um, feels that the interface is, is snappy and, and fast. Um, and it gives a better impression overall. Facebook, the same. You like something, likes instantly in the interface. You comment on something, comments instantly in the interface. And if you actually focus the search bar at the top, they actually fire off requests priming the cache ready for your search. So they're all about speed. Now Pinterest is an interesting one. Uh, I don't know if you've used it, but basically there's lots of pictures of houses and cars and uh, flowers and things. And, bas uh, and basically when you're scrolling down here, they have inf an infinite scroll. And so these things just carry on coming in and it's like there's no end of them. Uh, and the interesting thing is, they actually scroll really uh, aggressively. They load stuff in really aggressively. So when you're maybe like two-thirds of the way down the page, they're loading in new content. And they must cache it because it's seriously fast. And, uh, and the thing is, every single person, every single time a person visits Pinterest uh, and closes the browser, uh, Pinterest wastes data, right? They are shipping um, data to people that is not going to be viewed because it's below the page fold. Um, but this is actually worth it because of the design considerations, because it gives a much better uh, feel to the app. And it's not just um, web apps. In fact, mobile apps even more so. Instagram is a great example of this. If you like something, it's liked in instantly. If you comment on something, it's commented instantly. And when you're signing up, as you're filling in this form, you notice at the top there's this indicator, this network indicator. And you're wondering, what is this? Uh, like, wh why is it doing network requests while I'm signing up this form? What does it need to do? And the answer is that it's actually fetching a bunch of images from Instagram servers, like the, the top images. And so when you click done, you get to see like the best of Instagram, Instagram in its, all its glory. And it's like little uh, tricks like this that really make a good impression. I think the upload interface is actually the most uh, interesting one. So here you, sele you select a photo or take a photo, you fill in the form about it, you hit share, and it gets uploaded. And as an engineer, when I'm designing this, I upload the photo at this point. Because this is the only point that I know the user wants to upload the photo. Uh, when they click share, at any previous point, they could cancel. Um, Instagram uploads at this point. So you take the photo, you, and as you're filling in that form, the photo's uploading. And then you click share. And by the time you click share, the photo's already uploaded, and it's ready f in your feed, and all your friends have it and it, the app just feels much faster. But if you think about it, maybe like 20% of the time, people are going to be canceling this. And uh, Instagram are going to be wasting data, money, server time uh, but with like uploads that aren't ever going to be used. Uh, but it's worth it. This is a design decision, not an engineering one. If you think about it, the, uh, the App Store is actually probably the, the worst store on the App Store, ironically. Um, and this isn't some... Uh, server-side versus client-side uh, problem, in my opinion at least. 
it's uh, it's a case of where you're rendering. They're rendering on the server side. Uh, most apps on the iPhone render on the client side. Uh, the network on the iPhone is pretty slow, therefore it's like really noticeable. If they were rendering on the client side, then you could um, they could do mu be much more clever about things. They wouldn't have to like clear each tab as you go to it. They could pre-cache stuff. They could pre-render things on the client side. They could just be a lot more clever about it. But they're not. They're rendering on the server. So it's really noticeable. So the question today is, why would you optimize for failure? Most of these network requests are going to go through absolutely fine. Let's say you're updating a user. Um, that network request, as long as you've done everything right on the server, it's going to go through absolutely fine. Now, of course, people make mistakes. There are going to be bugs. Requests will fail. But why would you optimize for failure? Why would that be the default scenario? Why didn't you optimize for the, the optimum smart scenario, which is where the server re responds correctly? Uh, hopefully, failures, if you've done your job right, will only happen a tiny amount of the time. So you've got to divorce your interface from your network. So let's step back a little bit and look at designing an asynchronous UI. And I've been working a little bit on Subtle, which is Dustin Curtis's blogging platform. And it's great. It inspires me to write because it's really minimalistic. And I love it. And as you can see, like there's no formatting options here. There's no bolding or italicizing. Uh, there's nothing. It's just words. And it really inspires me to write. But this also poses some problems. Uh, I was looking to, to write an upload uh, interface to this where you could upload images. But the, the, the question is, like, where do you put uh, the browse button? Where do you put the upload progress? There's no like, UI for that. And what I realized as an end user is that I want to be writing my article. I want to drag an image from the desktop onto the article. I want it to be uploaded instantly. I want to carry on writing my article. Uh, and so this is what we made. Uh, we're going to use the HTML5 drag drop APIs. As you can see, we're binding to the drop event. We're accessing the original event because jQuery proxies it. And then we're iterating over all the files that are contained in this event. And basically, it was testing if they're images. And if they're images, we're going to be calling this create attachment function. Now, before I get into the create attachment function, I want to talk about its secret source. The secret source is generating client-side GUID. Basically, generating a reference to that image on the client, which will then be saved with that image on the server. So if we have a look at the create attachment function, the first line is that's exactly what we're doing. We're generating this UID. It's like a really bog uh, simple way of generating, make sure, making sure this uh, UID is actually unique by using the, the username of the person and the current time. That's pretty uh, guaranteed to be unique. Then we're using the form data. Uh, if you haven't used this, it's part of the new HTML5 spec. It's really nice. It allows you to do HTML5. Um, uh, sorry, it allows you to do multi-part uploads without having to deal with boundaries and things. And you can see we're passing in the file here. We're also passing in the UID which we generated earlier, and that's going to be stored on the server alongside the file. And whenever we reference the file from now on on the server, we will use that UID. And then we're basically using jQuery's AJAX function. We're uploading it. Um, and then the image is getting, getting uploaded. We're not even looking for a success handler. Because the key thing here that we want to have instant feedback. When I take the um, image and drag it on the uh, text area, basically I want the markdown for that image to be inserted immediately into the text area. And so the last two lines of this create attachment function is exactly that. We're generating the image markdown. And we're using that UID we generated earlier. That's the reference to that image. And then we're inserting it into the page. And so if you think about it, this is like the perfect interface. Um, I'm writing my article. I drag an image from the desktop onto the article. That image is there instantly in the article. I continue writing my article. By the time I've finished writing my article, the image has been uploaded. It's ready for previewing. You don't need any upload progress. Uh, you don't need uh, any browse button. It's, it's perfect. So the paths to an asynchronous UI. You gotta you gotta render on the client, you gotta still state in data on the client and communicate with the server asynchronously. So rendering on the client, number one, that's pretty easy. I uh, in this day and age there's a ton of templating libraries. In fact, the hard part is choosing which ones to use. Um, my personal favorite is Eco, but there's other great ones and uh, basically I would look at them, look at the syntax, work out which ones are the best that you the ones that are best for you, basically. 
One of the major differences between them, which is worth looking at, is um, some of them allow you to pre-compile the templates on the server um, so that your client doesn't have to compile the templates every single time, uh, which is also always a good idea. So if you're using like Rails or Sprockets and Sinatra, uh, it's really simple. All you do is just put a .echo uh, extension on a file, and um, then it will be rendered as um, an, an echo template. And Echo's format is actually CopyScript, and this a lot, looks a lot like uh, RHTML, but it's actually CopyScript. You have these angle brackets, and if there's an equals, then it'll be output to the page, whatever variable is in there. And uh, you notice that JST at the top there, uh, if you put that in the name of the, um, of the file, then uh, the, f the template will be appended to this JST um, object in the page. And this is just a function. And you call that function, you pass in a context, uh, it returns a string. It's that simple. I've been doing a one bunch of work on this app called Stylo. If you go, if you, any of you have got the internet, it's styloapp.com. And it's actually open source under github.com slash macman slash stylo. And it's basically a, um, an interface where you can mock up designs. It's very proof of concept at the moment. But all those elements there are generated uh, with CSS. And you can see the inspector on the right, and you can basically change the CSS there. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite advanced. It's probably the most advanced spine app there is out there, actually. You've got undo, redo, copy, paste. Um, you can edit the text and things. You can draw select areas over things, resize them. You could do the whole lot. And, um, and I was running into some problems, because when you have like hundreds of elements on the page, and you're s drawing a selection uh, area around them, that right-hand column it has to re-render every single time, and uh, and that's okay for 100 elements. When you get to 1,000 or 2,000 elements, that starts to get pretty slow because that rendering is happening in the mouse move handler, and if you add anything slow to the mouse move handler, then your users are really going to notice it because it gets really slow. So what I did is I found this thing called Request Animation Frame, and you usually associate this with gaming. Um, but it's actually a really neat feature, and it's in most of the browsers, and you can shim it if you need to. Um, but basically, you pass request animation frame a uh, callback function, and it'll, base and it'll execute that function whenever it's convenient for the browser, whenever it's a good time for the browser. So by putting the rendering of that right side in the uh, in request animation callback, it, go it gets really fast. So that's a little tip of view rendering. The other tip is to batch up DOM updates. So basically, the, the slowest thing you can do uh, when view rendering is actually communicate with the DOM. So do it as little as possible. Batch up updates. Uh, you can hide elements, manipulate them, and show them to make sure there's only one paint. Or you can manipulate DOM trees which aren't attached to the main body. Uh, basically, ma make it fast um, by communicating with the DOM as little as possible. I, gener I made this little library called Catapult. Uh, it's, a, it's a gem, gem is still catapult, uh, and basically it sits on top of sprockets, and it lets you easily do, uh, it lets you easily render views. Basically, it does all that for you. So you can generate a new app, catapult new app, and then you can start a server, or you can build it for production, or you can watch the files for changes and then rebuild it. Uh, it's really simple, and because it sits on top of sprockets, uh, you can just use the sprockets pre-processing um, comments. That'll pull all the files in. So, view rendering, I think, is a pretty solved problem. Um, storing state and data on the client. Now, this is slightly harder because this re requires a bit of um, a change in how you develop because you have to bring all that state that you uh, initially had on the server uh, and now bring it to the client, and that requires a bit of um, a change in how you d develop things. So, luckily, we have some great frameworks out there, Backbone, Spine, Ember. And the th key thing here they all have in common is MVC. And this is like really important to make sure that your client side doesn't just go into spaghetti. Uh, MVC basically means you've got to store state in the controllers, or they're called views in a backbone world. You've got to store uh, data in the models, and you've got to keep logic out the view. That's the key parts to MVC. And if you do that, then you can build a very complex JavaScript app um, without any problems. You've got to preload data. There's no point. In, uh, the, in having an asynchronous UI if the user is constantly waiting for new data to come in from the server, then don't be afraid from preloading like, more data than you actually need because it's much better to waste data than to um, uh, 
have uh, loading for the client. Uh, I'm blocking the client. So basically what I do is I just load in a big blob of JSON and don't think anything more of it. You've got to validate everything on the client. And the pros to validating everything on the client is that it's instant. Um, it's really quick. There's no request to the server. The cons are that A, you have to replicate validation from the server on the client, but also you can't do every kind of validation, right? There are some validations like validates uniqueness of that you can't do because for uniqueness of you have to know that like the f the state of the full app, you need to know every single, like validates uniqueness of a username, you need to have uh, state for every name and the only place where that happens is the database, right? Uh, so there's no easy solution for some val validations. Basically, you know, let's say you're signing up for Twitter and you're entering a username, it'll do inline validation. So as soon as you blur on that input, it'll look it up um, on Twitter's database. So hopefully by the time you click submit, uh, you can see if that username is invalid. Uh, but even when you click submit, you're still going to have to do a, um, a validation and a transaction uh, to make sure that goes through properly. But validating in Backbone and Spine is very simple. All you need to do is return uh, a string from a validate function on the model if the validation fails. Uh, it's super simple. All right, the last part, number three, asynchronous server communication. So basically communicating with the server um, divorced from your communication with the, uh, with the interface. So you've got to update the interface before you send requests to the server. Uh, I've made this little uh, example app. Uh, if, if any of you have internet, go to jscamp-chats.herokuapp.com. And uh, usually I find with these uh, examples, the first, the first message on these things are hello world, and the, the second one is a cross-site scripting attack. Um, but I have I've protected against cross-site scripting attacks. So enter your name, and then there's two versions of this chat. One, which is... Um, <laughs> one which is uh, synchronous, so when I'm typing in here, uh, and as soon as I hit enter, it actually um, waits for the server to respond successfully uh, before it'll update the UI. Uh, the asynchronous one is is uh, really simple beca because basically it updates the UI before the server responds, and it feels a lot faster. Um, basically, <laughs> the um <laughs> The, the interface is just a lot better because it's asynchronous. Um, so, <laughs> uh, the, if, you want, if you want the source for that, it's, under, it's on that gist. And it's like, it's a tiny Sinatra app. In fact, um, I've got an example later of how you make it. But the, f the first example is you post to the server with a message. You, update, you, add, you call add message when the server responds successfully. That's the only time that you actually know that the message is being sent out. The second one is you just call add message as soon as you send the message to the server. You don't care if the server responds successfully. Now in production, you probably want to add some sort of error handling to tell the user that actually this message didn't go through. Um, but you want to show it uh, anyway because the vast majority of the time the, the message will go through. Um, and uh, basically if the user sees the message in their chat log instantly, then they think that everyone else has received that message instantly. And, and so it gives a much better feeling. Uh, the, the interface is much better, basically. Um, and a little tangent, uh, there's this great thing called server sent events. And if you haven't heard of them, they are awesome for doing like real-time streaming to clients. And they're basically what WebSocket should have been. So to implement them, this is Sinatra. You just have a stream, you keep it open, and if you want to write to that stream, you write the in the message format data colon and the message new line new line and that's it that's all you need to do and this is really what WebSocket should have been uh, if you ever look, looked at the WebSocket spec it's uh, it's hilarious it's like times this number by 12 if it's a Tuesday that sort of thing um, and uh, service center events are much simpler on the client side uh, you have this uh, object called event source you just ha add this on message callback and that'll get fired whenever the service sends more data to the client and you can easily shim it. It's like available in Chrome and Safari and Firefox. But for IE, you can just shim it very simply. Anyway, so what Spine and Backbone give you? Uh, they give you client-side IDs, which we covered earlier. It's quite useful to be able to reference a model on the client without, um, without actually communicating with the server. 
They give you an asynchronous model API so you can update the interface before uh, you actually send the request to the server. And they give you a serial AJAX request. Now the last one we haven't really talked about, um, and this is actually something Backbone doesn't have yet. Hopefully they will add it. But you can you can see there's going to be a problem. Let's say you um, create a record and then immediately update it. So to the server you have a post request being sent to the server, and you also have a put request being sent to the server at the same time. Now the server is going to receive the cr create request and that's going to process fine. But the update the put request, the server is going to look for the record with that ID, and that I that record hasn't been created yet, so it's going to freak out. So you any destructive actions that you send to the server have to be sent serially. Uh, and Spine will do all this for you. So, if as soon as you call model to save, then the an update event gets fired, the, the view gets re-rendered, and a request to the server gets sent. And both Backbone and Spine uh, have this simple API. Um, and Backbone has this really neat feature where you can actually pass wait true, because sometimes you do want the server to actually respond successfully uh, before you update the UI. Um, so uh, ironically, I work for a payments company, and, uh, and it's like the one place where you can't really have an asynchronous UI. You can't tell someone they've paid uh, when they actually haven't. Um, so that's that's the case where you use wait true. Uh, and then in your controllers, you basically bind to the change event in the models, and re-render whenever that event gets fired. And then in the update, uh, whenever the, the form gets submitted or what, whatever, you save the model. Uh, with some values from the page. And then the change event is going to be fired, the view is going to be re-rendered, and then a request to the server is going to be sent. And that all happens for you in the background. It's, it's great. So what do you do if the user closes their browser while requests are still pending? So let's say they've sent an email and they close their browser. Um, that email hasn't request hasn't finished to the server. The, the server may not respond properly. And so we have a problem because the state is going to be out of sync. And the answer to this is really simple. Window.on before unload, um, basically return a string from this function and it will query the user as soon as they close the tab if they really want to close the tab. And jQuery has this really nice property called active. And it's actually not documented, but this is an integer that gets in incremented uh, every single new Ajax request. So you should say, if there are any Ajax requests, say, return, are you sure you want to quit the screen? Hopefully you'll come up with a better um, message than that. Um, but that's what Gmail does, that's what everyone does. Uh, it's, that's the way to do it. So, what do you do when the server fails? And I've uh, rather copped out by leaving this to the last bit of my talk, um, because uh, it's the bit that most people are concerned about. And let's say you send a, you're updating a user, and for some reason the server 500 is out. Like, hopefully that won't happen because you've done all the validation on the client, but let's say there's some error or some network error and the server 500 is out, what do you do? Because now you have inconsistent state. The database says one thing, the client's UI says another. And th the thing is, it's actually really hard to reconcile the state. It's, it's a really, really hard problem. And uh, if you look at, look at uh, apps like Facebook and Twitter, they don't actually bother reconciling this problem. They ask the user to reload the page. They say, sorry, there's been an error. Can you refresh the page? Now this sucks, but hopefully it doesn't happen very often. There's not much uh, point putting a lot of time into a scenario that's not going to be very common. So when the server fails, just ask the user to refresh the page. So a quick recap. You've got to lie. You've got to update uh, the UI asynchronously. You've got to cheat um, and pretend the server isn't there. And you have to steal and basically steal data from the clients when they're not looking. Don't block the interface. You've got to communicate with the server asynchronously, stay on the client, render views on the client, and preload data. Thank you very much. Uh, you didn't talk very much about like uh, things like local storage and IndexedDB. And if you think about how you uh, read email like on an Android phone, it seems like you know a lot of times you're interacting with data and data is being stored locally and then at some point in the future it'll synchronize with the server mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if we're gonna get to the point where web applications do the same kind of thing where you know if I'm trying to send a tweet it'll store it in local storage and then when it can it'll tell Twitter about it that way things don't get out of sync so easily uh, yeah so actually the uh, Gmail app on the iPhone does this uh, it'll store stuff in local storage and when you access it, uh, the EUI will be there instantly, and then it will update later with um, 
when the server actually responds. And uh, basically, this is another step. You can add synchronization at, a ne at the next level. Um, and you can store the data in record storage, or like you say, IndexedDB. Um, and synchronization uh, can be tricky, which is why I say to people, don't start off with like that. But you can totally add that at, at the next level when you need to. More questions? All right. Well, thank you for the talk. Applause for Alex. Thanks.